Welcome to the Burst Mode Bunker from the photography show. James joining us on the sofa from Digital Camera World. Uh, James, we don't have any products here. We don't have any product specialists here. We've got a clean table, clear for our thoughts on the industry. And you know, in, in a time of change where we are right now, um, I just wanted to pick your brains on where you saw some of the trends as best as we can see them in terms of products, but also in terms of terms of mood and what's next in the in the imaging industry right now. And I guess one of the things to talk about is 2020. It was destined to be a big year for camera launches, but also things to point those cameras at in terms of big sporting events. So uh, as 2020 was meant to be, how does, how does that all fit together with things like the Olympics and you know the Champions League? And Well, yes, I mean, the Olympics being a big one. So we know that, for example, professional cameras, we've got a bunch of them that were and some are uh, released at this point in time. So we have the Sony A9 Mark II that came out mm -hmm. last year, the Olympus uh, one the Olympus EM1, the OMD EM1 Mark III, well which done. has just come out, uh, the Canon 1DX Mark III, yes. which has just come out, and the Nikon D6, which has yet to come out. In fact, it has been delayed from its impending March release to May. Mm. All of these cameras, professional cameras, are released in Olympic cycles because we know every four years there's a big event with lots of very, very good athletes competing, uh, and every four years the professional photographers want the latest and greatest kit with the best autofocus, the best performance possible. And now we're looking at a situation where the Olympics might not take place. Yeah. Uh, so do people who shoot professional sport still want to shoot professional sport and buy new professional cameras if there's no Olympics, there's no Champions League, there's no NBA, there's no, everything's been canceled or postponed, where does that leave us? But of course, the other side of that is the availability of those cameras. You mentioned Nikon has already uh, put, put, put the brakes on one of its big releases because in terms of supply chains, can sometimes be quite fragile and quite finely timed at the best of times, but with what's been happening starting off in the Far East, in, in China and so on, many of the factories out there have been closed down for weeks so that even if the sport, even if the Olympics does go to time, there's you know quite a big chance that many of the uh, camera manufacturers wouldn't have been able to get stuff through the supply chain and into the hands of the photographers in time now. Yeah, we know that a number of manufacturers such as Olympus have, have, have the last couple of years have moved their manufacturing out of China to places like Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, they've averted much of the uh, ongoing situation, right. but any camera company is only one O-ring away from a <laughs> product being delayed. So it's not just the stuff that, you know, if you make your own sensors, you make your own bodies, you make your own anything. Everybody needs something that somebody else has got. That's sadly the world in which we live. We all need to buy stuff from other people. And so much is manufactured in the East, which has faced a long period of shutdown. And increasingly, the rest of the world is facing periods of shutdown. So there are going to be knock-on effects, both the stuff that we know about, such as the D6, yeah. and other stuff for later in the year that we don't know about, that obviously there are boffins working away in labs that um, we've yet to, been, yet to be informed of. And those things are inevitably going to, to face some sort of turbulence. Whether it's to a greater extent or a lesser extent, we don't yet know, but we've already seen, as with the D6 is a good example, that's uh, already making itself felt. Yeah. Any non-coronavirus related news? What cameras I, would have been game check? What cameras will be game changers or would have been game changers? So I think say? we can talk about the R5 in particular is a game changer from many perspectives, particularly in terms of video. And I think it, this yeah. is this marks Canon's return to taking the lead where we look at the 5D Mark II when that came yeah. out, that was a game changer. Yeah. Then Canon kind of, you know, pumped the brakes a little bit and sort of took their foot off the gas and said, well, okay, we're here now, we're good where we are. And other companies, particularly in terms of mirrorless with Sony and some of the other companies taking the lead, Canon is now re-exerting its dominance, saying, hey, we are the big boys, we're the biggest, baddest in the town. Yeah. So this is the camera that we can do, this is what we're capable of, so the R5. I think we can also talk about the shift to mirrorless is no longer a shift to mirrorless. I think we are kind of in the mirrorless domain now. DSLRs are still here, they're not dead, but now, if you're talking about cameras, they are increasingly mirrorless is the default position. Yeah. Um, and the idea of um, using a DSLR may become more of a niche thing towards shooting things like sports and action, where yes. having an optical viewfinder and those sort of things is, is much more advantageous. I think we can also talk about the fact that medium format now has been thoroughly democratized. Mm. And it may not be the old 645, the old traditional medium format. It is kind of a crop sensor version of medium format. Yeah, yeah. But 
it is now available to the masses, and that's thanks to people like Fujifilm, that's thanks to people like Hasselblad, making these more affordable for the everyman, somebody who might want to really elevate the quality of their images or the scope of their images. Now medium format is not just a pipe dream for most people, even for the enthusiasts. You know, these are still a few grand bodies, but they're yeah. not the astronomical as they once were. But what about the consumer end of the spectrum? Because you know, from what I see, we've seen that completely eaten away by the capabilities of smartphones. You know, you see some of the latest smartphones, Samsung Galaxy S20 and so on, five lenses in there offering people some of that uh, focal length um, flexibility that historically smartphones haven't been able to manage in the past. And that's had its impact on the dedicated camera lines, isn't it? I think so. It's, it's, it's a changing of the guard. And I think we have to stop differentiating smartphone photography from real photography. Yeah. I think now we have to accept that anything that takes an image you know, that's a camera, that's a device used for recording. So it's a case of picking the right tool for the job. If you're somebody who wants to, if you want to actively vlog and blog and shoot on the go, that's now a very useful all around tool, the one that's in your pocket. Yeah. If you're somebody who's never had any interest in taking pictures of anything in your life, now you have that ability. So we're, again, we're democratizing photography. Now everybody can become a photographer they want. So as you say, this has an impact on the, the lower, the more consumer end of the camera industry. I think that's only going to exacerbate and continue. There are great compacts available. Compact cameras, Canon makes some great compacts, Sony mm -hmm. makes some great compacts. We will go into the difference in image quality. That's the big differentiator. So your phone is a good all-in-one tool. Take the Samsung, for example. Now you've got something crazy, 108 megapixel camera if you, yeah. want that, if you want to push the pixels. You've got all the lenses, the focal lengths. But at the end of the day, a dedicated camera is still going to give you the best dedicated images. It's down to you if you want that or the convenience. Uh, well, uh, and, and that is the point, really. It's a question of what do you want those images to be used for? And you know, if you are shooting for social media, then you know, in terms of the image quality, it maybe it's diminishing returns and you know maybe i'm not going to want to spend you know a few hundred extra pounds when i've already got a camera that is good enough in my pocket and in many cases you know it's, it's just far more competitive in terms of accessibility in terms of availability and i think that gap is getting closer and closer and closer and, you know obviously for a consumer point of view that focal length challenge is one thing. We're seeing some of the computational photography smarts that cameras mm. have in, in, inside them these days in terms of depth of field effects and so on. That's another domino that's been knocked over in terms of the difference between dedicated cameras, compact cameras and, and smartphones. So it's, it's, are the likes of Canon, Nikon and Sony going to be continuing, do you think, at that uh, entry-level camera range, or is it more sensible for them to go for the mid-range and the upper end? I think that their lifeblood is going to be the mid-range camera and they will always have the, they've always serviced the professionals because we know for a fact that anyone who takes pictures professionally will always need a professional camera. But as we've alluded, this being an Olympic year, pro cameras tend to go in Olympic cycles. Yeah. So we know pros will upgrade every four years, maybe. Every four years, they might still be perfectly happy with their older kit, but we do know pros will always need pro kit. We know that people in that sort of medium sphere who like taking photographs, whether it's professional, semi-professional, or just out of interest, it is kind of the best hobby in the world as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> they would always want a pretty decent bit of kit to do that with. So what's going to keep going away is this lower end. But then again, as we say, there's always going to be room for something that has that bit more image quality, whether that's a bit better depth of field or, mm -hmm. or slightly better crisper video. But again, we have to look at not just the case of, okay, maybe DSLRs is a technology that's, that's kind of sliding away. Also, what are we doing with our pictures? You've just mentioned social media. So it's always an argument of a traditional camera. Well, you need that extra resolution, extra this and that, because you print out your pictures. I don't know how many people are printing out their pictures these days, and I don't know mm. how many people are printing pictures, certainly gallery size, to put on their walls or for exhibition purposes. So in terms of the output, does that affect the need for these larger sensor cameras? Or are we looking for more in the case of, again, it's that middle sphere, because you don't need something that's 100 odd megapixels, whether it's a phone or a medium format camera, something in the middle that just takes a good, decent sized picture. It looks great on social media, it looks great should you want to print it out, but again, this is, this is a complete landscape change as far as imaging is concerned because more people than ever are taking pictures and fewer people than ever are actually printing them out. Mm. So there is that middle ground to be found, I think. And of course, we're talking about photography here, but video is the other half of the photography show and the video show. Um, with, with Canon's EOS R5, this is a camera that I know you've had some close-up mm. times with uh, in, in recent days. Uh, and the impact that the 5D Mark II had 
what was that, 12 years ago? Going back a while. Yeah, yeah, it is going back a little while. But how that changed the industry and all of a sudden that uh, democratised high quality or the perception of high quality filmmaking with the, with a full frame, shallow depth, the field effects and yep. stuff. Um, where the R5 brings us now, it's somewhere that Canon hasn't been for, for a little while. And I've certainly felt that, you know, it's, it's 8K video. And from, from what I understand from chatting with you and other people who've had you know, a little bit more time with it, it seems to be uncompromised. 8K as well. Definitely. That, that was the, the big thing. When Canon announced the R5 and they said, well, it's going to be an 8K camera. Well, 8K can mean many things. Mm -hmm. You can do an 8K time lapse. You can do 8, 8K clips of you know, 10 or 20 seconds. Uh, what Canon was very, very clear to me about was that this is an 8K camera that it has dual pixel CMOS AF. Uh, it's 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 8K that is full sensor readout, so it's yeah. full width. There's no crop. It's not like was the case in the 5D Mark IV and the EOS R, which yes. was cropped in. So you don't have to worry about your focal length on things. You don't have to worry about the depth of field being compromised. This is uh, this is an absolute 8K beast. And what's interesting is, as you say, the 5D Mark II, Canon really shot ahead of the market and said, "Hey, this th we're here. We're making waves. This is a big thing." And then it really took its foot off the gas mm -hmm. and it let a lot of competitors sort of zoom ahead. And now it's kind of like, well, wait, wait a second now. Okay, we took a while to get going on mirrorless, full frame mirrorless at least. Yeah. Uh, we took a while to get to grips with this 4K stuff. At the same time, you have to give it to Canon that they didn't do it until they could do it properly. Yeah. So I think while Canon may in some respects be quite conservative in some of the moves it makes in terms of being aggressive, well, they've waited until they could do 8K, full readout, uh, up to 30 frames a second, in camera, so it's internal. They waited until they have that kind of horsepower. They're not doing it piecemeal. Uh, the same with the autofocus. So the, the, the R5 has animal AF. Mm -hmm. We don't yet know if that applies to video. It may or it may not. But in terms of a technology, Canon was keen not to release a camera that does animal AF just on dogs or yeah. just on birds or just on cats. They wanted to do a camera that can do animal AF for a variety of creatures and beasts. So now they're doing these things. And I think it's a real signpost that, hey, Canon is here. They've got this new... RF system established now. It's got the Trinity lenses. We've got new lenses on the horizon. So this is a fully fledged system. And in terms of video, it's going to, I think, do what the 5D Mark II did 12 years ago, 10 years ago, however long ago it was. Which is really, really exciting. And again, you go down to the other end and you look at what smartphone manufacturers are putting in, in terms of video smarts into their cameras. Uh, it's, you know, you look at what's next and what's exciting. Obviously, there's a a lot that's uncertain at the moment, mm -hmm. at the time that we're recording this, and you know what, what cameras are going to come through and become available, and what events they're going to become available for. But what we can see on the horizon, example with the R5, is really exciting, really interesting. Are there any particular areas that are exciting you in terms of what you think that's next? In terms of what's next, well, well, 8K is going to be the new 4K. That's the new battleground. We see this in um, traditional electronics, in terms of 8K television, and 8K yeah. displays for PCs and laptop computers and all that sort of thing. But 8K, for example, we have the sharp 8K video camera. Mm -hmm. So that's doing similar things to what Canon's doing with the R5, but this is using a micro four thirds sensor, so a smaller sensor, and that gives you a much more nimble camera system. Yeah. Now the R5 does, and this is going to be Canon's first camera that has in-body image stabilization, or yes. IBIS, which again, that we, we didn't even mention that, but that's a massive thing. People looked at the, when the EOS R came out, it says, oh, it's got cropped 4K, it doesn't have IBIS, blah, 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 blah. Now Canon's got, well, wait, wait, this camera does. Yeah. This has got 8K and IBIS, and what Canon, the way I believe Believe this is going to be sort of tailored is their, their in-body stabilization is going to work in league with lens IS. So it's similar to what Olympus has done. So Olympus on the EM1 Mark III and the EM1X can do up to 7.5 stops of stabilization, which wow. is just that's yeah. <laughs> pretty ungodly. And that's using 6.5 stops in body and an extra stop from the lens. So if we think Canon's taking that and applying that now to a full frame sensor, that's pretty special. But at the same time, so we know that, can, uh, that Sharp, the Sharp 8K camera uses the smaller format, so it's giving you that option. Do you want a slightly larger full frame system with yep. maybe larger lenses and a bigger rig? Yeah. Or could you want a smaller, more handheld nimble system? So I think 8K is kind of, it's a bit geeky and it's one of those things that maybe traditionalists say, oh, you don't need all that stuff. But I think if we're looking at where the next battleground is and where the next battles are going to be won or lost, 8K yeah. is probably one of the biggest ones. I think we're a long way from 8K being mainstream in our living rooms yet. You know, there have been some, some 8K to launches at CES and IFA and so on, but you know, I've only just got a 4K TV. I'm mm. not going to be replacing that anytime <laughs> soon. But obviously, from a filmic point of view, the, one of the benefits of shooting 4K if you're delivering in full HD or shooting 8K if you're delivering in 4K 
okay, is that ability to push in and, you know, potentially get multiple frames out of a single shoot, which, you know, if, if you are a solo runner and gunner, whether you're a journalist or shooting corporate content, actually from an 8K frame, having the ability to, to push into uh, select multiple camera uh, shots from a single frame is is timeless really and particularly if you're delivering not only for 16.9 but for 1.1916 different social formats as yeah. well having that extra degree of latitude is going to be really beneficial it's going to be expensive in terms of workflow and i think that's the, that's the other thing here if you're shooting 60 frames 8k you know each frame is what 33 megapixels equivalent of big hard drive you're going to need big hard drives <laughs> but well, to take it back to what we were just talking about about the consumer end so what, what i think is interesting canon on the g7x the latest power shot mm -hmm. that's one of the first cameras, in fact, it's the first one I know of, that you can shoot video in vertical orientations. You can turn the camera in portrait because for Instagram stories, Facebook stories. So that is the first body uh, of, a, of, a, of a proper compact camera, yeah. if you like, that's taking that into account. It's the changing landscape of what we use video for. So you can shoot 8K and crop it down to any shape or size you want. But if you are somebody who just wants to vlog and live stream and have stuff ready made for Instagram and Facebook, you can buy a compact camera that does that for you and it gives you superior quality to your smartphone in, the, in a form factor, you can put a microphone on, you can stick a lighting. Yeah. It's very, very clever stuff. Video, video does seem to be the new megapixel race. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? I know, I know quite a few uh, traditionalists, uh, broadcast friends will be watching this going, vertical video, no! <laughs> but it's a sin. This is the changing world in which we live. Uh, listen, James, thank you very much for uh, sharing some of your industry insights here in Burst Mode. Such as they are, it's a pleasure, sir. Thank you.